Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. Hi, I'm Joe Mishka welcoming you to another episode of Rural Heritage TV. This will be our third episode visiting with Russ Little of Dry Ridge Outfitters at Harriman State Park. Last week we watched as Russ and his crew saddled up about 40 horses for a couple of trail ride groups coming in that day. Today we're going to watch the last of them come back to camp and the saddling operation go in reverse as they send the horses back to pasture. While they're doing that, we're going to listen to Russ tell us a bear story with his father and stepmother, Kevin and Deb Little. We're also going to take a look at some of the young stock Russ is raising up from foals on a couple of nearby pastures while we listen to the bear story. If you like big blue roan saddle horses, you will enjoy looking at these young ones. Finally, we're going to go on a very early trail ride looking for elk that were just beginning the rutting season. We find scores of them and listen to the bull's bugle and the cow's chirping while watching them in the meadow below. The regular saddle horses will only make me money about five months out of the year, but the half drafts and full drafts, I can usually be making money on them 10 and a half, 11 months out of the year because when we're done here, they'll usually get a lot of November off and then we go into our sled season and then we'll put another three to 400 miles on them there doing sleigh rides. And so a big, you know, 1400 pound half draft is just a money maker. They can hunt, they can pack the, the guests in the summer. We can do sleigh rides with them. I mean, there's nothing that a horse can do that they won't. And so right. th those are the ones. I don't, I try not to have a lot of horses that are running on welfare, so they've all got to pull their weight. We'll have, we'll have 10 employees plus my four kids and my wife running the phones. And so it's, it's a fairly decent sized thriving small business. Yeah. And so if I can get two or three years out of each Wrangler, I'm happy. Um, it's kind of a catch 22 because if you got someone that's a lifer and they stay here all the time, you know they're not trying to go after other things and, and, and learn more. Right, right. But also you, you get these college kids and they'll come for a year or two and then they're on to bigger and better things. So you just, I tell them to give me everything they've got and I'll be their buddy for the rest of their life and try to help them out wherever I can. And we've had probably 45 employees over the years and still friends, really good friends with a lot of them. I had a kid that worked for me when he was way young. He was probably 10 when he started and helped me up on up through high school. And he caught me at the gas station, gave me a hug the other day big old tough burly guy now you know but just told me thanks for everything that I taught him because everything in his own personal business that he runs now he runs a fencing business he says he often thinks back what he learned here today you know it's September 1st today and we're kind of just transitioning we've pretty much ran our summer season which runs from Memorial Day till now and then we'll kind of start transitioning this week where, you know, we're up here every single day in the summer. And then from Labor Day till Halloween, it's reservation only. And then our ride times expand. So we'll start riding at 6 or 6.30 in the morning. And the last ride can often come in as late as 9 in the evening, well after dark, because we're going out and listening to those 
those elk. So our days end up being longer, don't take quite as many people. Um, a lot of my help goes back to college. And so we kind of just run it with the family. You've seen our America's Rural Yesterday three book set covering life on the farm in the early 1900s. We're excited to bring you a fourth edition to the series, Early Tractors, featuring more than 250 photos of early American tractors like Alice Chalmers, Oliver, John Deere, Farmall, Minneapolis Moline, and lots more. Most of the photos are of new or almost new tractors back in the day, showing exactly how they were configured when they came out of the factory. Tractor collectors, history buffs, and folks simply wanting to reminisce about farm life in America's Rural Yesterday will love to have this book. It sells for $24.95 plus shipping. If you buy more than one book in the series, the price per book goes down all the way to $69.95 for all four books. To order, call toll-free 877-647-2452 or visit www.mishka.com. That's 1-877-647-2452. The year that I was working for him, uh, we were running uh, the Ridge Ranch where Dad worked and kind of helped raise us up. And we were also running their business. And so we were working out of the same barn. It was kind of a family business. It had me and my sister, and Dad and Debbie were working, and we just kind of kept everything going. And on this particular ride, we had a, a group, a family of four, uh, from California and me and my sister were going to take him and I think I was 22 and I think she was 21 and we went up and uh, just kind of left from the barn and as we left the trail Debbie the last thing she said to us oh you forgot Betsy who's our uh, shotgun and I said oh don't worry about it so we're just going up the canyon never seen a bear there forever and so we just left her at home and we rode up to the camp and you know, we got everything set up and it was kind of a family of eccentric people to say the least and so we went ahead and got everything situated and we got dinner put together and the next day it was a three-day trip so the middle day we take off and we go on a day ride and we come back and uh, there had been a bear in camp and it had trashed our water shower and our table and had tried to break into our coolers and stuff like that and so I'd seen a little black bear cub in there some time before, but I wasn't super worried. And so we went ahead and got everything situated and uh, got everything put, put away and got our, our dinner out and we started cooking dinner. And it was starting to get evening and here come all of our horses out of the upper meadow and they come running right down into camp and they were stomping and pawing and making a big scene, which they don't normally do unless it's either a moose or a bear. And so I let, let them there to eat and kind of get dinner going. I took a little walk up through the upper meadow and then I started getting a little uneasy realizing that uh, all I had was this little miniature can of pepper spray and a little kindling hatchet. <laughs> and so I got walking back and I was looking at all of the horses and they were all still looking up the canyon except for my personal little Morgan mare and she was looking down past camp. So I looked where the horses were looking, I couldn't see anything, and then I looked where she was looking, and just outside of camp, there was a grizzly bear crouched down next to a root ball from a tree that had tipped over. And uh, I, the people said, did you see anything? I said, I didn't up there, but I said, look right there. And they said, is it a grizz or a black? And just then this bear stood up, and I could see the big old hump on its shoulders and the little teddy bear ears, and I said, that's a, a grizzly bear. And they said, well, what do we do? And I said, well, we'll just hang tight for a second. And I busted me off a stick about that long, and I chucked it at him and missed the first time. But the second time, I hit him in the head. And he reared up, and he started jumping on this stick, <laughs> and busting into a bunch of pieces. And I says, he's pretty serious, folks. I says, you probably ought to back up. And so as soon as they started backing up, this bear started getting a little more agitated and a little more brave, and he started pacing back and forth along this log. And the whole time the guests are still filming it, but then they're backing up. So we have that part on, on film. And then this bear stood up on this log, and he stood up nice and tall, and he popped his jaws, and he grunted and threw some slobber around. And then when he came down off this log, he came at a run towards me. Wow. And so I went running towards him, yelling and screaming, and he stopped, and went back, went back to his log, and he did the same thing again. Paced back and forth, stood up, shook his head, charged me again, got 10 feet closer that time. 
uh, did it again. I pushed him back. The third time he charged me, he got 10 feet closer, and he was probably only 25 or 30 feet away. And he didn't turn away immediately. He just sat there and stared at me. And I thought to myself, he's done bluffing. Next right. time he's coming in for real. And so I scurried up a tree that sat right over the picnic table, and he immediately came in and sat down at the table and started helping himself. And so I whistled at him, and I had that pepper spray, and I'd never shot it before, but I was under the impression it shot like uh, wasp spray. Okay, a but, string. Yeah, a but it sprays like hairspray. Okay. And so I sprayed him, and he winked and blinked a couple times, and then went back to eat. Sure. So then I cussed at the can, chucked it at him, hit him in the head, and he jumped up and took off. And so now my sister comes back into camp. She says, we got to call Dad. It's getting serious. So I call Dad, and I get on the walkie-talkie, and I said, Dad, there's a bear in camp. He's not leaving. <laughs> and uh, Dad says, is it black or grizz? I said, it's a grizz. And he says, well, build a big fire and get your pepper spray handy. And I said, well, I've already used the pepper spray, and Jamie's got the fire five feet high and roaring. <laughs> and... Uh, and he says, oh, okay. And so my sister grabs the walkie-talkie and says, Dad, you get in here, you bring a gun, you shoot this bear before he kills us now. <laughs> and by now, it's dark. When we come back, we'll hear the ending to the bear story and take a look at some of the young horses Russ is raising to join his trail herd. We're back with Russ, Kevin, and Deb Little as they finish telling us about a grizzly bear that was harassing them at camp. <laughs> and so Dad and Debbie jump in the car at their house, drive the 20 miles to the barn, get up there, and there's a colt with two rides and their stud horse at the barn. <laughs> so he looks at Debbie, which one do you want? She says, I think I I'll the take stud the stud horse. horse. Even more broke. <laughs> and so then they go up the up the canyon, up the up the mountain there. It's another 20 miles to get up on top. By now it's pitch black. Right. It's dark. Right. Right. And they come off the mountain. And this is the Morgan blood again. He knows right where camp is. He's been there before, and he takes a straight line and takes wow. him right to camp in the dark mud rocks, bush wow. wagon. And so they make a bunch of noise, come into camp, and we've got the fire going. We put the guests to bed. They're all in one tent. We've tied horses all around their tent, we've done everything we could. So they come in, make a bunch of noise. We think they've scared the bear off. We sit around the fire, tell them There's the story. And what else are you going to do? Right, right. We go to get ready for bed, and Dad kind of starts looking over my shoulder, and he shines the mag light over my shoulder, and that bear's sitting right behind me just at the edge of the firelight. And so from then on, it's a back-and-forth exchange of fire and trying to drive him off with, with the shotgun and the rifle and scaring him away. So that goes on all night long. We finally go to bed. Dad says I stay up all night saying, shoe bear, shoe bear. And my sister's <laughs> telling him he's eating everything. And Dad says, I'm not going to go out there and chase him around in my underwear in the dark. He's just going to have to have everything we got. So we get up the next morning. The first thing the guests said, because they knew Dad, because they stayed at the ranch we were working out of. They said, Kevin, can't you hit anything you shoot at? And he says, it, it's a $10,000 fine. I lose my outfit and license, and I go to jail if I shoot one of these things. And so we load up that group, and uh, we take them home. But during the ruckus, one of our pack horses had ho with hobbles on it started hopping home. Okay. And so we had we were short of pack horses. Right. We had to leave part of our camp. Uh, that was a Sunday. Monday we had to turn around, and come right back in with another group. Okay. That group shows up, walks up to Debbie and says, the mother says, I hope you know this isn't my idea of a fun vacation. It was my daughter's <laughs> turn to pick and she chose this. And we had to go back. And so, but we had to go right back. And as we're riding up the trail, they said, and by the way, we don't want to see any wildlife, especially <laughs> bears. Do you ever see bears? And we say, nope. We saw one bear like 20 years ago and it was running away from us. Uh, but here's your pepper spray, buddy system. Don't go anywhere without someone else. This is how you use it. Why are you guys so worried about bears if you've never seen them? Safety first. <laughs> Play it off. We get uh, just about to camp. It's me leading six pack horses, then Debbie, and then the four guests. We haven't got to camp yet, but I can feel that bear there. Mm -hmm. I turn around and just look at Debbie. I don't say anything, and she says, I can feel it too. <laughs> really? Yeah. So we pull into camp, and well, camp's we're... trashed again. And so he had 
you know, messed up our chairs and our tables. There was nothing edible there, but he just was like right. making sure we knew that he was there. <laughs> and so we'd walked over this kid, you know, city kid, never left the city park. Uh, he's 12 years old. We'd take him over to his tent so he can throw his stuff in. And that bear had taken its claws and stuck him in the top of the spring bar canvas tent and ripped five oh shreds clear to the ground. And he says, uh, what did that to my tent? And I said, that stupid porcupine's been there. <laughs> <laughs> and he looks and says, that's a mighty big porcupine. <laughs> and so we get everybody calmed down, and we're sitting there having dinner, and the local mountain man shows up and slides right up to our table. We're sitting there trying to have dinner, and we're already on edge. And he comes in and he says, where's that bear? I'm going to shoot me that bear. <laughs> and so he's had this big, tall black horse he had a rifle down either side of his saddle he had his six shooters on all the holes were filled with bullets he was from the movies yeah yeah he had a handlebar mustache wild rag wow. silver ring you know he had it all <laughs> he comes in and, and uh he had a queen-sized mattress slung over the top of his pack mule so he rode over to my camp or where i was camping where my tent was pulled one rope flipped the mattress out there's camp come in started telling bear stories <laughs> <laughs> and then he was gone the next morning Never so, did see the bear that night. Yeah, never we? saw the bear. And then we got up the next morning and we moved camp. And the, they didn't want to move. We said, we're moving. We're moving camp. There's no we feed here. We, we got to go all the time. We just keep on moving. And they're like, why, can, why can't we just stay here? This is a great camping spot. We said, we just got to keep moving. Keep on moving. There's a bad porcupine. Yeah, yeah there's a way. vicious, vicious porcupine out there. And then we never saw him. Didn't use that camp for the rest of that year or the next year. And then Debbie ran into him at a lunch spot a couple of years later and recognized the old boy. Wow. And so yeah, because, well, you, they used to graze sheep in that country. Okay. And um, the year before this all happened, they uh, took the sheep out. But those bears were habituated to coming in just about that time of year. Wow. And so I, I believe that's why that bear came in. And so maybe we broke the you know, the, his habit Cycle. by not Cycle. going in there for the next two years. And we use that campsite all the time now and no other bears thing. When we come back, we'll go out on an early morning trail ride looking for signs, sounds, and sightings of elk that were just beginning their rutting season. If you enjoy seeing how our ancestors lived during America's rule yesterday, you're going to love looking at these books. Volume 1 is fieldwork showing horses and vintage tractors preparing seed beds, planting, cultivating, and harvesting the crop. Volume 2 shows the work being done in the barn and farmyard, feeding and watering the livestock, getting the crop into the barn, milking the cows, shearing the sheep, and collecting the eggs. In Volume 3, we go inside the home to see the family in the kitchen canning vegetables, in the parlor listening to the radio, and in the dining room for family supper. We also head into town to shop at the general store or visit on the town square on Saturday night. Each book has over 140 large format pages. They sell for $24.95 each, or you can buy two for $44.95, or all three for $54.95 plus shipping. Call 1-877-647-2452 to order. That's 1-877-647-2452. We got started early, before sunup, to look for elk and weren't disappointed.
This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information. Or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.